Okay, first item is going to be an update from our Chamber of Commerce. Jennifer. All right, I put a package in front of each of you, and for anyone that wants to know what we're up to, I'm happy to share it. Unfortunately, it's way too big of a file to send via email, so it's um, a sort of a Dropbox or a drive situation. Um, this is an update on the, uh, the Chamber as the DMO for the county. So destination marketing organizations, uh, that's what we are for the county and the city of LJ and East LJ. So we do all of the marketing for the county and um, it's all visual. So it's very hard to stand up here and give a report on everything that's visual without showing you guys photos of everything. I wish I could uh, lift this a little bit. Maybe I'll take the heels off. Um, so some of the highlights for 2021, some of the ways that we spent this money that the county sends the chamber as a part of state law has gone towards. Um, and some of the highlights are, well, hiring new staff. I'm new, obviously, in 2021, and Heather Luther on our staff as a tourism manager is new in 2021. We created a crowd counter, and if you, are, if you aren't getting that in your email, let us know. That uh, estimates how much our occupancy is full uh, for the given week and the next weekend, and so therefore how many people are going to be in town helps a lot of our retail establishments and restaurants um, staff for the weekend, knowing that if occupancy is at 50% or 100%, that's a huge difference in how many people will be in town. So if you're not getting the crowd counter, let us know. That's a benefit of the chamber. Uh, we purchased air DNA software and arrival software. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, we purchased and designed the first Gilmer County billboards. You can see them coming up from Florida. I think they're like the Valdosta, Tipton, McDonough area. We hired a, a professional videography and photography company, Outlook Creative, to produce a series of videos which are in production right now, the first one that's drafted, um, and photographed so far over 100 local businesses in HD, dining, lodging, shopping, and things to do. Um, we awarded $50,000 in grants to nonprofits in the area. That's a brand new program this year. That's a way for us to use some of the transient lodging tax money that we receive from the county and the cities and give it to nonprofits that also host events that, um, that tourists can attend. We know that not all events are ours, so that's a way to share the wealth a little bit. This year we've actually upped that to $75,000. So if you have a nonprofit or you know of a nonprofit that could use that, let them know to call me and I can walk them through the process. We um, created an entirely new website. It's not launched yet. We're tweaking the last stages now. It's beautiful and it's definitely due. The last one is almost 10 years old. Uh, the new one has a new calendar integration system where anyone in the community can add events to the calendar, so which, which is really nice. Uh, we hired influencers and partnered with travel writers. We contracted for an entirely new Gilmore County tourism publication. So instead of all the 12 different brochures that are shining, um, dining, lodging, shopping, waterfalls, hikes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it's all going to be in one really nice big magazine, which we're working on now. Uh, we did new welcome center signage, new downtown welcome decor and contracts, completed a new downtown map, redesigned. Um, and all inclusive for every business and restaurant downtown. We placed ads in over, well, dozens of publications from Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and more places. Uh, we represented Gilmer County at the Georgia Governor's Tourism Conference, Georgia Association of Convention Visitors Bureaus, Southeast Tourism Society, Northwest Georgia Regional Tourism, and several travel writers conferences. And so here's where the pictures go, which I had a slideshow for you all, but, um, Promotional items, there's some of those baggies for you. Pretty much all that's left from the last campaign. Uh, next year we have a campaign every single month that has a different promotional item that will lead people to a different um, set of stories or itineraries. Um, and it's really fun, we've got some really cool stuff coming. So promotional items, you can see the speaker at the house wearing our mask there when he was signing bills. I kind of love that picture because everybody else is in black but he's in the pink LJ mask. Uh, digital social media and website, we're doing a lot more with digital. So every story that you see out there in Southern Living or pop up top 10 this and that usually comes from the chamber in some capacity. Um, Downtown Welcome Center and the East LJ Welcome Center are both run by the chamber. Um, printed materials, like I mentioned, we do all of the brochures and maps for the area. 
The crowd counter, which I mentioned, there's a screenshot there of how that works. The two-week forecast, which currently we're at about 60% occupancy this coming weekend, but it skyrockets during Christmas, and it's nearly 100% for New Year's. So for all you locals, New Year's is going to be full of tourists. Um, uh, Airbnb, Air DNA software that we purchased tells us um, where all of the short-term rentals in the county are. Currently, our average daily rate to rent a cabin in LA Bay is $260 a night. The highest is in October when it's closer to $300, and the lowest right now is um, November where it's $245. The occupancy rate throughout the year is an average of 77%, with a 93% in July and a low of 52% in January. And the average person that owns a cabin in LJ makes $4,846 a month on renting it out. <clears throat> That's the type of stuff that we can learn from the software that we purchased. Other things are with arrivalists, we know that the uh, average overnight trip is 57% of our visitors. They come overnight and 43% are making day trips here. And the primary markets are Atlanta, Tampa, Chattanooga, Orlando, Greenville, Birmingham, Macon, and down from there. So we know where people are coming from and how long they stay on average from all those different places. Um, it's a bunch of seasonality and market share, which I don't have to go into ad nauseum, but there is a clip here of the entire show of Road Trippin', which was, it aired on Fox 9 last Wednesday. Um, but there, you can see it now if you go to news channel Fox 9 and look, uh, look at the Road Trippin' show that they do. There's an entire show about L.A.J. and they did our apple houses and wineries and lodging. I thought they did a pretty good job. Um, there's a link there to our one of the drafts of our new tourism videos. Uh, we have been filming all over town. You might have seen us. We've done three shoots already. We have another one next week, actually, more of a Christmas winter shopping. And then in April, we have another one. And in June, we have the last one. So then we'll finally be done. I included some shots of all the ads that we've done with some of that recent photography that we paid for. Girls Weekend ads, um, rediscovering Georgia as an adult when you used to come here as a kid, um, Apple Houses, winery ads, and there's a whole bunch of pages here, which I'll show all of you, of some of the beautiful new photography that we've got at all the different um, stores and restaurants around LJ, Apple Houses. Um, so all of these will be used on the new website. Um, there's a shot there of the three billboards that we have coming up, since most of us don't see them. Uh, one is specifically about apples, one sort of generic, and then one specifically about LG wine country. And then looking forward to 2022, we have a lot going on. Um, we're gonna have a weekly radio show on WJLA, um, talking about everything going on, events and whatnot in LJ, and we're paying for that, but any nonprofits that have events going on, and submit that to us and we can um, squeeze it in well, about five to ten minutes every every week. We have the new tourism magazine that's going to be published by Atlanta Magazine. New tourism campaign of It's All LJ. New monthly promotions which I mentioned. So for example, January they're going to be wine openers because we have wine about winter. Uh, February, I think we're doing uh, like cutlery that you can take with you. March is all about dogs and we're going to highlight some of our dog friendly trails and shops and we're giving away pop-up dog bowls um, and each one of these has a promotion with it uh, we have a new tourism committee of the chamber the board of directors decided um, that and i recommended that we have a group of um, either board members or citizens representing shopping dining lodging etc that could um, help steer the conversation of how we market the area i would love to help um, new enhancements to the East LJ Welcome Center, uh, new staffing, uh, increased funds for tourism uh, community grants. I mentioned that's going to go up to 75 this year. We're going to finally launch that new website. Uh, we're going to launch up to 12 new tourism videos, commercials, um, and put some of those on Hulu. And I have a few shots there of a sneak peek of the new website to see what it looks like. So we are very excited. It's beautiful and super classy but yet um, really tells the story of Gilmer County farming community, and um, so we're very proud of it. But then I also included the 2022 budget. This is how the money in 2022 will be spent, which is very similar to how it was spent this year. Um, I put more in 
digital and a little less in print, just because that's the way the world's going. And um, this number of total revenue of 980, that is reflecting what the county has budgeted of what they assume transient tax income will be. And then, our, and then I calculate our percentage of that. So this is matching what your budget is. If that changes ever, let me know and I'll tweak ours. Any questions? Thank you, Jennifer. Okay. I actually do have a few questions. Sure. Sorry, Jennifer. Yeah, no um, first of all, thank you. Um, you've done a great job this year, I just want to say. You had some big shoes to fill. <laughs> As Paige had lots of big shoes. Okay. Um, but I, I think you've done a great job and I appreciate all the work and really diving into the community and getting to know our businesses and also I, I applaud you for that. It was a big job and um, you've done a great job. I also think the photography is absolutely beautiful. That's the first time I've seen some of it. So, so yeah, so very excited about that. Um, I also want to ask a few questions. Um, I know that um, that the city of LJ is contemplating moving um, their hotel motel tax increasing. They have not decided that yet, but you sent us um, some comparisons of numbers as if, if we would have increased those numbers and yet taken down the actual, I don't want to say this the wrong way because it's not, we would increase, actually, could you just explain? <laughs> I know you don't have the papers in front of you, but sure. I'd like for you to kind of let are who's here to know about um, that conversation. They may not have been in the city of LJ. Um, we were given some numbers that are pretty dramatic that would help our uh, general fund and allow us to do some projects that we haven't had money to, to do um, okay. for the county. So I just want, I'd like to have the conversation whether or not, you know, not making any decisions, but at least bring up the conversation. I'm sorry. Sure, so the city of LJ asked me uh, to present, um, and obviously it's not the chamber's decision, it's not even a chamber initiative, but just because I've been doing this for 20 years, they asked me to come and talk to the city about what would happen if they increased their tax on uh, tourists, on lodging, so short-term rentals, hotels. They're currently at 5%, and they were considering going to 6 7 or 8%. The, the change that happens, once you go over 5%, you open up what is called TPD, which is Tourism Product Development, so that means that a little portion of the money that you take from, from tourists that visit can go into developing things like um, river entrances, wayfinding signage, parking lots, uh, public bathrooms, um, anything basically that visitors can enjoy. Um, right now at 5%, we're at 5% at the city and at the city of, LA, um, city of LJ and the county, we don't have funds to pay for anything that is brick and mortar. And they consider even like wayfinding signage brick and mortar. So ours is 100% marketing, which is why my report is all marketing. Um, and that's a state law. So the city of LJ was, I mean, they, they have parking issues and they have wayfinding issues. So they were looking at a way to pay for that. And so going to six, seven or eight would do that. So I just did a calculation for the city of LJ. If they increase the tax, what would that look like to their bottom line? And when I did that, why not do it for East LJ and the county? So I did the same thing. Um, and it takes an act of local legislation to change. Um, and you can go up to 8% in the state of Georgia. So the money at 6 or 7 or 8% changes dramatically. So if you have, if you go to 6%, um, the DMO takes like 43%. The county would take like 43% and then the, le the last 8% would go to TPD, which is still county money, it just has to be towards product development. You go to 7%, those numbers change a little bit more to be more like 12% TPD, and then if you go to 8%, the numbers change a little bit more to go to about 18% TPD. So it's something to consider. Um, uh, a lot of our neighbors have gone up. I know the city of Blue Ridge is topped out at 8%. I think uh, Bannon County might have gone to 6% just to open up a little bit of TPD. So yeah, um, right now East LJ is at 3% and LJ and the county are 5%. Did I answer that? <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, so so, yeah, calculation wise, um, when I was doing, I did a projection of just what 2021 uh, would have looked like if we were at different percentages. I think that's what you're talking about. It is, right. Yeah, so <clears throat> the chamber wouldn't 
the amount of money that we get wouldn't change, because that's state law. It has to be 40% no matter what. So at 5%, we get pretty much the same as we would if you guys ever went to 8%. So it doesn't matter to us. We, we don't have any skin in the game in that sense. I just wanted to educate the city of LJ on those changes, because I think they are moving forward. Um, but if you ever wanted more from me on so that. So I, I did want to clarify. So state law is that the chamber stays at 40%. Well, it depends on, the, that's the minimum oh. at five. So at, at 8%, I think it's like 44%. It's okay, so that's like where those two percentages you get. Yeah, there's just little tweakies, but it's all around 40 to 45, okay. no matter what. Okay. Um, and that's because it was set up like in the 70s that if your community has a tourism-based economy, people are coming here, they're shopping, they're dining, that there's a mechanism to make sure they keep coming back, and that's why promotion of the area was um, significant. So they always want some money to put back into what is bringing the money, in other words. Right, and of course, the way I look at it, it's also projects that would benefit our community, our residents that live here oh, as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, they say tourism product development, but that doesn't mean that everybody else doesn't enjoy the basketball courts or the, the I don't know, there's all sorts of things. There's a list of what other communities have used it for, so. Okay, I didn't know if the board wanted to discuss this possibility at all. Do y'all have any interest in? I know in the current time, maybe down the road. I don't mind finding out more about it. I'd like to know um, a little more about the law. I think our county attorney can help us there. Yeah. And if you ever want someone from the DCA to come down and talk to y'all, we've got a good relationship with them. And, um, that's a good place to start. I would say that anytime a, a community, especially something, a community like ours that has a county and two cities in it, it's really best to do it all together at once, if at all possible. I don't think that that, I think that ship sort of sailed with energy moving forward, but it's just something to think about. I understand the city of East Allen is going to stay at 3%. Currently, right now. Mm -hmm. but I understand they, three or they go to five. They were kicking around five, but last I heard from Mac, they were going to just stay at three for now. That's what I heard. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, so, is that something that to add, I mean, to add possibly to our next work session, um, Hubert, to hear from the attorney to continue discussion because we can't talk outside of this meeting so <laughs> and just <clears throat> I'd like to know more about what what we might run into that we don't know about so uh, I don't mind looking at the the possibility but I'd like to know a little more before we get too far down the road uh, I, so I don't mind hanging on the agenda With you, Jen and Charlotte, to add it to the agenda. Okay. Thank you very much. Of course, thank you. Thank you, Jen. Okay. Up down, Parks and Rec.
25 or 30 teams in just for a Saturday. And baseball is a two-day event. And we can have as many as 40 teams in, in town for, for a two-day event. So the word's getting out that we have the fields and you know, the complex is pretty nice. And, uh, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the people are wanting to reserve cabins, so that's going to be a big plus. Even with the softball, they can play all day on Saturday, then they can hang out all day on Sunday. And some of these, like in the past, they've been looking two or three days, you say two or three days at one time. So the fields in the next couple of years are really going to start Do I have any questions? Questions? I have a question. Uh, someone mentioned that why don't we use the old tennis courts as basketball courts? You got the fence around it that keeps your ball out of the river, and uh, I wonder if we've given that any thought rather than tearing it down. I, I have, but uh, the issue with it is whenever they uh, put the new coat of basketball on, they didn't put a bond in age or anything uh, in between the two. So what happens is when it rains and then the wintertime happens, it freezes in between the two layers of basketball. So there's no way to keep it from cracking. And we've spent I don't know how many thousands of dollars in the past re re redoing those scores for tennis scores, but you can't keep them from cracking the way they're built. So in order to you know, build them right, that asphalt needs to be pulled up and then a new base put down and a new layer put down. Otherwise, you're just putting your money over bad like they've been doing for 40 years. Isn't that a possibility? Yeah. That was my intention. My intention was putting the basketball court there, but also really far, far, far parking also. Because that little parking lot that's there adjacent to the, the big playground, it can't handle the, the flow of the walkers and the playground at the same time. So part of that was going to be made as parking, and part of it was going to be a basketball court. So are we moving forward to that? Or? Yes, I mean, that's in the plan of doing that. And what time frame? Well, we were just talking today about about tearing the fence and everything down and getting it all pulled up and, and, and getting it started. Which I had that in the I had that in the budget, but finding contractors to get to it for the past year and a half is just been hard and hard to do. You're gonna take the fence down and put up a new fence. Well I'll take the fence down and pull the asphalt up. But I mean for the basketball court. Yes, you know, the fence. Yes, yeah. Once okay. we build the basketball court we'll put a new fence up. But that's all in a that's all in a plan to you know, and I can go with that when we uh, got a chance. But that's We've been in charge to talk about that from, from day one on, on that test board. So, again, any idea of the time frame? So, so the time we haven't funded it yet, is the problem the time frame can be uh, essentially. I mean, it's what a, it's, something, it's something I could put in next year's, in, in next year's capital. As, as doing, the, doing, the, doing basketball courses. I've got the I've got the money in the budget right now to get the fence up and get the asphalt up. So right. that it could be in next year's 2023 20, budget to build that. Or 2022 money budget. Yeah, if the money's available, we could do it in 22. Okay. We were sort of easing into it. Okay. But that's part of the overall plan. Yes, that, that okay, thank you. Right. Thanks. Update from the Black Path Concourse. Good morning. Uh, I missed the last meeting, so your report show two months. Um, and it was really close to our 2,000 rounds um, a month. October, we were right at it. November and November, it dropped to about 1,300. Um, and so far, <coughs> December, it's looking real good. Um, weather's not good out there today, but it has been. Um, still very hard to get stuff. I cannot buy stuff to buy. When you order it, you might get it in six months. It's just, it's crazy. Um, yeah. I've never had to work in November to get something in March or April. Um, what I'm seeing is not even the best in the show. Um, as far as the course, uh, the course is in good shape. Greens are as good as I've ever seen them. Um, right now, we're finishing up all the leaves. That is a full time job in the bottom. Um, and I've got a couple projects that I'm going to do, hopefully, uh, by the end of the year. If, if I can get some equipment in and the uh, 
air weighing on 12 and 9, I have got to get big. So uh, we're going to do all that in advance. Hopefully, uh, that we're going to come in. We can get done. Update from Public Works, Ryan. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we are finishing paving the Lakeview. Uh, the removal of the Timber Ridge, and as long as our weather holds out, uh, we will continue to pave. And if it doesn't, then we're just, it's just going to roll over into 22. And we're going to do our dead level best to start paving earlier in the year in 22. So that we're running into this problem and uh, trying to put a target on around Christmas. Uh, we are finalizing the paving list for uh, our uh, application for 22 uh, LMA grants. And uh, we're also continuing to work on our road crew work items as uh, time and materials and weather permits. If we're, if we're not paving, we've got stuff to do. Our, our, my boys are not sitting idle. Uh, the solid waste side of things, we uh, have a new vendor selected for our convenience centers and we're working with him to minimize our downtime as we're shifting over from waste management to waste pro. And uh, obviously we're in the beginning stages of the, the low station project where it's the, uh, the big lift that doesn't really see any action on the ground until we get all the players in place. Uh, that's all I got. Does you have any questions for me? I do. For waste, man waste management, waste pro. So. Can you explain how that transition is happening? Uh, the contract with waste management uh, is ending on December 31st. And I received an email from uh, Dick Knight with waste management when, with their notification that they were not moving forward with them. And they're gonna, he's going to get in touch with his guys to start removing the, uh, the compactors and receivers from our convenience centers. And I've been in touch with Jerry Harrison of Waste Pro. He's been out checking the sites to make sure that he's got the uh, uh, the proper phase motors and everything to, to seamlessly transition as much as possible. Um, get them in touch with each other so they can coordinate days. And we're going to minimize as much downtime as possible. Uh, talk with Jerry, and if there's a problem uh, with, a, with an overlap, we're going to be open top containers at those convenience center sites. Um, ideally, we're going to be doing swaps on the uh, on the off days for White Path, White Stone. Uh, Particate things like that, but the Tower Road Center is going to be the big one that we're doing our swap on there because that one's open seven days a week, really. So that, that's going to be our, our big one that we're going to have to coordinate together. And uh, so far, everybody seems to be working well with each other. That's great. So that our the public knows that there is a transition about to take place yes. and to have a little grace, yes. a little patience yeah, as we good. transition to that's new good. equipment. And Absolutely. And new, and, equipment, and, and new equipment is brand new equipment, which would uh, minimize our downtimes with the gym and casualties or anything like that. Thank you, ma'am. Update on the swim pool, Stephen Beaver. <coughs> For those of you who haven't met him yet, Stephen is a new project manager. Had been holding the fire to these folks. <laughs> uh, good morning. <clears throat> uh, both are new at this job, and um, <clears throat> just trying to pick up pieces of uh, what Boy has uh, has done in the past. The big problem we're running into is finding a engineering firm that will uh, tackle this project. The nearest one to us is Jacksonville, Florida, <clears throat> and. Uh, there they need to employ a, an engineering firm in Georgia because of all of the um, specs in Georgia versus Florida. The one in California did not work out for us. <clears throat> and um, at, at the moment, I'm, I'm working with Bell Reed trying to see if we can um, pull it all together with them because they, they have the uh, facilities to do the engineering outside and bring it to bring it to um, all together for us in one package, rather than trying to have an engineering firm on one side and a pool builder on the other. <clears throat> I really don't know how that works within the county yet, but I'm learning. Um, there, it was brought to my attention 
uh, late last night or this morning, there's a few things that are not listed on this. I, I got in touch with Eddie this morning to bring me up to date as to uh, what is not listed on this paper that we, we need to have in here. And I'm waiting right now for an email back from him. But uh, uh, as far as the pool goes, um, we're still, even with the adding the additional when Bowie and I were out there talking to them, uh, an equipment room, <clears throat> which is not in this, it was $27,000 added to it to um, put that in. And I, I would think that it's going to be a um, block building. Yeah. Other than that, I don't have a whole lot yet. <clears throat> well, it needs to be a block building because yeah. we okay. need to keep the moisture out. So right. A wooden building would not be survived. And at this point, I think the, the important thing is just the fact that we need to add twenty-seven thousand dollars to that. To the uh, it looks like, but then when I went back over it, they have an equipment room in it, so I've got to specify with them okay. what equipment room is that yeah. versus the equipment room for uh, the pumps and all that. So, right. Okay. Um, right. Because it was on the sheet we got about that. Yeah, that's. Um, <laughs> And we're going to have to have the conversation regarding an outside engineering firm uh, that can come up with specs that we can use to have everybody bid against. Um, <clears throat> so honestly, that's been the biggest holdup we've had on this pool this whole time, is trying to get that. We've got uh, several pool vendors that say they will give us a turnkey estimate uh, <coughs> They uh, would have their engineers do the engineering. They would build it all to those specs. Um, and we have not been, we have not considered that as an alternative in the past. We're still working to try to get an engineering firm to do that. And I know David's still concerned about the fact that we need to do that. But at some point, we may have to start considering the possibility of, of uh, putting out an RFP for uh, pool companies that are willing to just come in and give us a turnkey solution to the whole job. Because I don't want to be sitting here this time next year still trying to find an engineering firm. So, no one uh, wants it, that's the problem. No engineering firm yeah. wants this project. I, I, I do still have the applications of design or just public? Cool. What, what one thing I've run into just in the two weeks I've, I've been here working on this is everyone is busy, it's not a big enough project, and they're too far away. Like the Jacksonville, even if even if we paid the fifty, sixty thousand dollars, we still got to cover all their expenses coming here, which uh, are not in that fifty to sixty. Um, you could you could well be over what we what you guys paid for California. <coughs> to cover their overnight expenses to come here and look at the project and so forth. Um, I, I just can't find anybody. Lloyd had worked with it, just can't find anybody who wants to tackle it as far as an engineering firm. Um, so we're no further than we were a month ago, really, are we? No, absolutely. Uh, probably no further than we were a year ago. <laughs> In two weeks, I've been trying to pull this together in about Three other projects too at the same time, but you know, uh, this one everything seems to be as it has in the past going slow. <clears throat> I'm trying to trying to speed it up by uh, working with somebody that can do a turn. <coughs> it'll be it'll be on our agenda for our next meeting um, to really have the discussion of turnkey versus continuing to try to find an engineer. And that's not to say that the turnkey folks are not engineering it, they just doing their in-house engineering. And I do understand the downside to that and would much prefer to have outside engineering. It's just a question of how long we're willing to, to um, wait in order to try to find somebody that will do it. Uh, Bell Reed has, uh, does not have inside in, inside engineering. They use a, a company that uh, 
does all their engineering and that's what they're proposing is to use that. Yeah. And, and when I say inside, I just mean uh, generated by them as opposed to uh, an outside engineer that's put something out that everybody can bid against. Right. Well, why couldn't we go to that firm directly for the engineering? Um, well, the other ones I've talked to, um, Aquatic, for instance, is I can't see any enthusiasm from them because they're wanting the engineering uh, spec and everything before they'll even talk to us in, in detail. No, I mean, why don't, if, if you don't want the engineer, engineer, why can't we go directly to the engineer they would use? That's my next. That's my next and step. Boy, them, they would be our engineer then. That's my next step. Is to try to see if I can go around get with Bellamy Reed and see if I can go directly to them sure. and separate the two apart. Good. That's that's what I'm trying to do now. Separate. separate. Very good. Any other questions? Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. <clears throat> Under unfinished business, resolution on bids for enhancements. Um, who do we have here? Anybody? Yeah, there you go. Chief, you want to give us a rundown on that? Morning, commissioners. Um, we did send out uh, bids posted in the paper for the two-week period. Uh, we did get one bid back from Custom Truck and Body Works. We did build our last ambulance. So high quality, great vendor for us so far. And we'd like to proceed with that vendor for the purchase of the ambulance. I get real nervous when we have one bid on a $200,000 project. How much? How much did we did we try to send um, information to other vendors about what we wanted so they could bid on it? It gets posted in the paper. No, I'm, I'm not talking about. I'm talking about. Did we not? Did we go proactive in trying to find vendors? In the previous year, we did, and the business came in hundred thousand over uh, what local bidders or local vendors. So our closest vendor and local vendor is actually Custom Truck and Body Works. But well, we really didn't uh, take a proactive approach on it then this year for this bid. Uh, probably not like we did last year, uh, but considering last year's proposals that we got in, uh, they're out of state. Uh, they can't service our ambulance, they're outside our service area. They'd have to go to a dealership or uh, it would just... What kind of service are you talking about? I can't if there was um, an issue unrelated to the motor and the drivetrain. So if we had lights that went out that were under warranty, if we had um, issues inside the internal box of the truck that there were issues, we would... Uh, it would be complicated versus we have a facility within a drivable range. And we set it up with the bid process that we would want it within a, a certain radius of Gilmer County Fire Rescue. We can certainly get proactive if you prefer that. Well, does it? Uh doesn't it make sense? It does make sense. Um, with the um, with the stipulation that if we want to set a certain range, uh, geographical range for, for servicing and so forth, I think we can still get proactive. We just need to get uh, proactive with uh, dealers within that geographical area, if that makes sense. Our yeah, closest vendor excluding custom truck and body works last year was out of Texas. Texas-based organization was our, our closest outside of Georgia last year. Okay, what I'm hearing is we're restricting it by location, so it's a sole becomes a sole source situation. It, it well, it, it turns out to be a sole source in that they're the only ones that bid. 
Um, we're not uh, literally trying to make it there, but neither are we being proactive to um, try to get people outside the geographical area. But we certainly can do that. Well, if you're going to limit it by geographical area, what we're hearing is though, there's no one else to bid them. So. What I'm saying though is that we don't have to limit it by geographical area. We, we can <coughs> decide that we'll take somebody out of Texas, you know, if that's where the commission wants to go. Well, what I did hear from you, Chief, is that you did check them last year. So last year we bought. Them. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah. So um, last year, and you did have the higher bids, and you chose this one as the lower bid, and you're very happy with the truck. Yes, ma'am. So and that it's close to be serviced. So I, I hear you, Hubert, on being concerned that it's a, uh, the only bidder, but the fact that it is who you were happy with and the truck is running well and we're very happy with uh, the service we get from them uh, being able to actually take the truck and it's drivable it doesn't have to be trailered and transported somewhere uh, it can be towed without a very large cost to that facility uh, they can actually come to us if needed so we, we've had great success with them they build a quality truck uh, we we're very pleased with the, the last product that they sent out for us. And then there's no one else in the state that does that builds them, or that you're aware of. Or Not that I'm aware of. Uh, I know Orlando has a, a very large corporation, uh, but that we received funding through the current, the original uh, CARES Act. We purchased an ambulance from that company that was a demo, and uh, the quality was not as good as. Uh, our current bidder for this year's ambulance. Did, the, did that serve your needs? The quality might have been the same. Did it serve your needs? Oh, which ambulance? The one from Orlando. It did. It does serve the needs, but it has had quite a few mechanical issues. Mm -hmm. Is there any delay with COVID and everything? Are there are they back ordered or is this are we in a uh, most of the chassis are there's uh, a delay. I mean there's uh, chip delays with some of the chassis. Uh, we're looking to go on the Dodge 5500s, which is what we spec out last year. Uh, we've had no mechanical issues with the Dodge versus our Fords, so we've been happy with the Dodge. So it was spec out with the Dodge 5500 chassis. And this vendor is able to get the 5500s. We haven't made initial contact to award the bid until after you know we had this discussion here and on Thursday. Sure. Uh, so I'll know better. Uh, I can call and see what their timeline is on the chassis, but they don't order the chassis until they get the the bids approved. I just know there's so many things that are delayed, and I don't want to prevent you from having a, another ambulance in 2022 from. I yeah, we, we'd like to have it purchased, you know, spec. It's already been, you know, we have the design and the specs, which were met by that vendor. Uh, they will, as soon as they get to it, then they would purchase a chassis or let us know what that time frame would be. So, usually it's a six to nine month process. I will not hold this up with a condition that in future uh, bids we'd be more proactive. Yes, sir. Find out some more. Surely we can get some competitive bids. That's all. Yeah, that's reasonable. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, discussion of possible action on memorandum of understanding to establish the school board as a sub grant recipient of the county. I'm I still got question marks on that. Not about whether or not it's a good thing, but just what the heck it is. Um, I mean, that's pretty cut and dry. Yeah. I don't have. Uh, I don't have a problem to it with what I've seen. I guess we don't really have 
a proposed agreement. No, I think we just have some samples. Right. Okay. Is this something that there's a timeline uh, or a uh, deadline? Only if it's uh, with a specific grant. And I'm aware of the specific grant to the, from the school board side. Okay, so we could um, move this over to the next month's agenda and not have to be part of the that we can check with the superintendent for the court and see if he found that we can do it. Okay. Um, assuming the superintendent hadn't found out anything different, we got all okay with just putting this on the January agenda. I would think the school system would be anxious to do this so they get supplements. They are. But I don't know if anything, the question was, is there anything in the pipeline that would necessitate you taking action right now? And I don't know of anything. I don't mind delaying it, but I don't want the school system saying, well, you're delaying us getting supplements to people. Well, we would only delay it if the superintendent said that there's nothing uh, imminent or in order. <coughs> And I, I, honestly, I tell you, I don't mind going ahead and approving it if uh, if y'all are okay with it. I'm, I'm just a little puzzled as to what we're being asked. We're being asked to apply for the money to go to the school board. And it's for supplemental, it's for bonuses. I'm sorry. It's for bonuses, right? I think so. He's I don't know the best we need more information. I, I think it would be for that, but not limited to that, was my understanding. But. Okay, I'm, I think just waiting. No more. I'm here from. I, I'd like to see something that we would actually be voting on rather than examples. I agree, I just... Uh, I guess I wouldn't probably have it on the agenda since so we don't have that. Yeah. So I'm not willing to go forward. I mean, to put it next to mine. Okay, so... We come to the fun part. The uh, rezonings. The first one is for Tyler A. Whitlow from R1 Residential, low density to A1 Agricultural. And as I understand it, uh, this is to provide for a zoning match um, for this property and that they're wanting to use it for a small farm. Personally, uh, I'm okay with anybody that wants to use something for farming. I'm fine on one through eight. I'll have to leave it. That's time on two since it's a row. Okay. Um, people here who are interested in the proposals for the rezoning so rather than just say we're good one through eight I'm going to give a quick <coughs> synopsis here. Two is R1 residential of NC Day 1 agriculture is to combine with a with an adjacent parcel for conservation. Three from R1 to R2 is to combine properties. And the question I have is why are we combining it as R2? Uh, three and four uh, are the same people and to combine the properties. 
Um, and, but they specify that it's to build, I think they say in there, a single house. I'm, I'm wondering why R2 and not R1. They, they already have their home there. Yeah. And they have multiple properties that belong to them that are already zoned R2 and they are hooked to county water so it is the eligible and, and it would be less properties to rezone. They only have two that are okay. R1 and they have about three or four that are R2. And the, the one house that they have is all they'll be able to put on that property because it'll be one parcel in an R2 zone. <laughs> okay, so by approving that, we're not opening the door to... Not, nothing they don't already have. To them, what's not already there, okay. Uh, five is A1 to R1. Uh, they want to split a parcel from that, uh, from the large track, to, to <coughs> acres out from, uh, I forget how many, with one home built on it. Six is to combine with, six is for R1 to C1, and they want to combine this with the current C1 and then sell it all together. This is located up behind the uh, emergency room in the old hospital area. Seven is R1 to A1. Um, it's 1.27 acres to combine with an adjacent parcel. And eight is 34.8 acres. They want to split out two acres for a single family residence. And the remainder uh, will have three homes. Um, I think those homes are already there, aren't they? Yeah, okay. So that being the case, I'm good with one through eight as well. So. Um, now, nine. Um, this is the Williams estate. From R1 residential low density to R4 residential multifamily, there is a recommendation from the planning board to deny this. Um, these folks were told, this is their second second go around with this. They were told initially um, that uh, it came to us with a recommendation of approval, provided they uh, they got traffic. Uh, <clears throat> some traffic reports and also some engineering reports of an area back behind this. Um, uh, and they declined at that time. So they brought it back and in the planning meeting still did not have any of these reports and seemed to be surprised that the planning folks weren't looking to go ahead and, and pass it through even though they didn't have the reports that they were supposed to have with them. Um, now, this is, um, I should say that this is out of 9 and 10. It's, it's both the same people, the same project, just different plots. Um, I thought the, uh, the developer acted a bit unprofessional. Uh, he got up and basically said, uh, you don't want our money, we'll take it and leave, and kind of stormed out. Um, This, so this came to us with a recommendation to deny, deny and personally, uh, you know, I might say deny. Um, I'm a bit disappointed that the developer has decided that he's going to do an end run around us. You know, I've been telling folks that not all the growth that you see in the county has been approved here. If somebody buys 30 acres of land that's rated uh, already zoned R1, they can put a certain number of homes on that and they don't have to come through us. The fact that it's R1 gives them the right, assuming that it perks and the health department's okay, it gives them the right to put a home every acre and a half. Uh, so that's what they've decided they're going to do. Yes? One thing that, uh, yeah. that you're not didn't talk about was the green space density. You may need to. <clears throat> I was going to try to talk to you earlier yeah. about this, but I didn't get the opportunity. The R1 green space development that does allow you to reduce 2.25 acres if you have water and sewer, but there are density requirements within a green space development and that will severely 
limit the number. So how many are we actually talking about? 12, 14, max. Okay, initially it was, it was we were really going to maybe 60 with both tracks. Yeah, that, it would be probably a maximum of seven per track okay. with the density. Now they could reduce some of the lots to 0.25, but there would be no uh, logical reason to do that. Yeah. You're so they're looking at maybe 12 to 14, unless they want to again come back through here. Mm -hmm. Yes, to leave okay. it R1 and develop with green space. Now, if they don't do green space and they just do acre and a half tracks, that may give them a little more, maybe two, three more tracks. So okay, well, I'm not as disappointed as when I thought it was going to be 60. Yeah, yeah. And, and that was that was uh, that was a good find from uh, okay. survey. I guess I was just bothered that I felt that they acted very unprofessional in the planning and zoning meeting, and uh, still am bothered about that. Anyway, um, the recommendations to the nine, nine and ten, and personally, that's the way I think it should go. Oh yes. Thank you. So that uh, takes us through the rezonings and brings us to citizens wishing to speak. Anybody that wants to speak on any topic? I have a hard time keeping my mouth closed. I guess you can open it. Yes, sir. We need to get you on. The, we need to get you on the recording for our minutes later. seems to be a thing all over North Wood because we're closer to uh, places that we have to, to get disposed of to put up our pulp industry uh, with it would be coming from clearing of lots. We have to haul it 70 miles in order to do it to, to, to get rid of that. Yes, sir. And then I had one other thing, of course, uh, that, I, that concerns me. Is I know we're promoting bicycles and all this kind of stuff, but uh, I've been here my whole life and I, I realized that uh, the world has got to change and is changing and, and will change on and on. But we have a tendency to rebel against change, I think, and say, oh, we get. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, there's a road that's in our area. It's called the Conestoga Road, I mm -hmm. think you're correct. Yes, sir. And uh, this road would 
built uh, just before I became of age. I remember when it was in the Protestant uh, in its beginning. But this road was funded and completely built by the Department of Natural Resources, U.S. Forest Service. And I understand that there's been some talk among the commissioners about uh, uh, putting a black top surface on this road, or part of it. Uh, there's no, I don't know that the county is receiving, I've not heard of any benefit that we were receiving any income that the county is receiving from the care and maintenance of this. Yes, sir. I'm not aware of any uh, conversation about uh, doing anything with Conestoga Road. Well, I just heard it through some of the people that live in there who said they didn't think it was on your agenda to do something with it. I know that I was greatly uh, enjoyed it and appreciate the same when, the, when we were abandoned and maintaining part of Mary County, mm -hmm. which is, again, it's a national forest, but it's right. not. Yuma County has no deep, no real right to do anything on this road. It's uh, a lesson. And this gets back again to all this was originally intended to be maintained and proceeds from anything that went on in the National Forest was to help to uh, support our school system. Mm -hmm. and so I, I uh, know that part of the road, even from the beginning of 52, and it goes all the way to Eton, 411, which was originally built as a National Forest Road. And uh, I know Mary County has a tremendous out over there about maintaining part of that road mm -hmm. without some support. And I think that anything that Yuma can does or what we should involve the U.S. Forest Service or either we get a deed to it or it. Actually, I, I thought the U.S. Forest Service was who maintained Conestoga. And that doesn't mean that, that, that I'm right, but, that, but I thought they were maintaining it. Well, uh, I don't know of any maintenance. Uh, uh, the county, uh, our machines are mowing all the right of way, and their trucks and their graders are going constantly that way, and working that comes on the road. And it, it did include Port of Mary County, but I think it took, it took three months ago to go. Now, I think we're, we're thinking maybe of, uh, oh, what was the name of the road that uh, we had to deal with Mary County? <coughs> I don't remember, I think part of the time I saw you yeah. maintained up, up toward the, the lake, I think beyond the paving we tried to Okay, but we haven't talked about paving. No, not that I'm aware of. The only thing we've talked about is the Murray County deal. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm aware of. And there may be a connection to Conestoga on that road. I can't think of the name of that road, but it wasn't Conestoga. Oh, well, the sign says it's going to leave by the way. Mulberry Gap, that's right. I don't know yeah. that things Mulberry now because of uh, but uh, okay. Conestoga Road is what it says on the sign when you leave uh, Highway 52 and it's okay. Conestoga Road from there all the way to Mary County as far as I know. Yes, sir. And, 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 uh, well, there's been no discussion that I'm aware of putting any paving on that at all. Uh, when we first began having a board of several members, I think probably started in the five. At that time, uh, this section of Gilman County, which is about a mile and a half, uh, that is, was paved and it was all done by the U.S. Forest Service. I said, I mean, you know, when I, when I watched this. And at the time, that this five-member board here, that road, that portion of is paved up into the world, you know, the shake right ago, I think. Right. That portion of the pavement was completely resurfaced by a state. No, no participation of the county. The, the paved section was re mm -hmm. resurfaced by the state. And uh, that's been a bunch of years, and it's beginning to need resurfaced. And that, that road was built with a 16 inches of, of base underneath it, and as long as it is kept sealed, there'll never be a problem with that section of the road. And, uh, Again, I appreciate you 
time. I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't see spending money on that road unless the county has a deed to that road or right. something the problem in those parcels. So, right. Uh, right now, I, we're maintaining U.S. Forest Service roads as well, and I see it got to be traveling and what we're doing. Well, it, it does look like uh, Consulga Road is a county maintained road. Um, it is becoming, yes, I agree. It's, well, it's on our county maintenance list, but uh, but there's, there's no indication of that we're paving the unpaved portion of it. All right. Appreciate your time. I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, I um, think it's important to represent Ms. Gail Dodson today. Um, poor lady would just like to be able to get out of her driveway on the 282, traverse that with her father who has had a stroke, and she's her, his primary caretaker. Can I, can I mention something there? Um, what is the name of this road again now? Brook Hollow Circle. Brook Hollow Circle. I'm familiar with Brook Hollow Circle. Uh, and I read the comments um, in the, um, on Facebook about that. Uh, the thing I don't understand is Gail has called me directly in the past, and we've gone right up there and, and done what she wanted done and, and, and got her fixed up. And would have been perfectly willing to do that again. I know she said she's called the road department and didn't get a response, but uh, and having read that in, in Facebook, you know, we're obviously going to take care of it. I just wish she had called me and said, Charlie, come do this again. And, uh, the first I heard about the condition of it was when I read it in Facebook, like, over the weekend. Oh, she has nothing negative to say about you. She actually, oh, I didn't mean in it that way. conversation, said that um, she appreciated that you had personally mm -hmm. taken it on yourself to address the issue in the past. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's in some sense she didn't want to feel like she was burdening you personally with an issue that was a road issue. And I appreciate that, but yeah. I, so I, so I, so I hate it that it went far enough, though, that it's this serious of a situation for her, so. Well, yeah, I, I, it's unfortunate for her. I think she's just kind of got her hands full. And she's yeah, saying, well, I can please understand that. out here and take care of it for me because, you know, um, and I, and I believe her family, you know, has been here for multiple generations in a certain community. And I think that um, we don't want to leave the people who are natives, yeah. especially if built this county, you know, behind in the progress. Well, we don't want to. I, I, now, I might have to, to take some issue with the fact that we're maintaining the new, uh, the, the new building, uh, what am I trying to say, new construction roads, and not hers. Um, if she said we're not maintaining any of the roads properly, I might have, uh, you know, accepted that better. But we're not being uh, selective about it. We're, we're doing what we can. Um, and having said that, we, we happen to have the roadmeister with us today. So if you would make sure that Brookhalla Road is fixed up. We'll take care of it. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Yes, I'll pass that information along to her. And and I didn't mean to imply that she was being disparaging. I was just disappointed that it got into that condition before I knew about it. Well, when you create a format for people to come and rumble, you tend to get a lot of grumblers. So That's okay. <laughs> that's so, okay. Then, yeah. And then they tend to get more help. Well, and I so. think that's great. I think there's a place for what we do and advocate for the community. Yeah. Um, because they can't all be, be here for one reason or another. So they do come to uh, myself and others to say, hey, we've got a problem here, I have a concern there. And I get to be the voice and the face of that here, but, um, and I'm just a private citizen. I'm not anybody that's special here, you know, um, but, but I care and people think, I think people know I care. Yeah. And so they come to me and then I, like I said, I come here and I just kind of, um, yeah. and, and that's what you get from me. Um, it's not that I'm not appreciative for all the hard work you all do. And we care too. Yes. <laughs> you care and we care. Yeah. yeah. But the, 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 the challenge is you all have, this is you're on that side of, of the equation, you know. I'm in the I'm boots on the ground, right? So the perspective that I get and the interactions that I have are, are going to be different. Even even with Miss Dodson, with you, Mr. Paris, um, you know, she considers you a an ally. 
um, to, for her, but she doesn't want to bother you. So I think that there is a place for what I do and others are doing where we just say, okay, this is what's happening here. The natives, if you will, are getting restless, and you all are the chiefs, if you will. And so, um, you know, there's a place for just regular old swallowing and stuff, right? There, there is. And, <laughs> and I don't want to give the impression that, you know, all you have to do is call me and you get your road fixed, because that's usually, you know, not a, not a good thing to put out there. Um, I will say that this time of the year when we're trying to finish up our paving and we've got the road crew really dedicated to trying to get that, those last little bits of paving before it gets too cold, um, a lot of times the things that don't involve paving, like this, where we need to go out and scrape and gravel and that sort of thing, um, by the time we get to where we can really turn our attention to that full time, it's typically which roads are in the worst condition. And those are the ones I usually hear about. And uh, those are the ones we have to try to get first. And, and that's why, given the condition of this road, you know, we're, we're going to try to get somebody out there and get it done quickly. Um, but I don't want to give the impression because Gail's a good friend. I don't want to give the impression that, you know, you're a good friend, so you get your road paved or, or fixed. Um, we do it based on how bad the road is. And when it gets this bad, we do it quickly if we can, so. Perfect. Um, so the road issue brings me to another question I have related, but not directly. Um, Recently, somebody on the Keep Gilmore World page posted some overhead drone videos of what's happening out in the vineyards at Yukon. And, um, you know, there are, folks are not too, not too happy out there. I'm sure you don't know what to tell that. Yeah. And um, one thing that stood out to me is that there are an enormous amount of gravel roads. And I began to wonder, you know, and I've asked this question in the past of planning and zoning, uh, about, I happen to know that the um, Creekside Crossings subdivision that's down to the south of us is all gravel roads because I've seen the lots and plans. And I thought that was really an unusual, but I was assured that the it was a no big deal because the developers were going to maintain that. And, um, and it gives a country feel. It was a sufficient answer for me at the time. But then as I looked at what's happening out at Yukon, I started looking at the immense number of gravel roads. And I started thinking about my own gravel road. Why would they, um, that's gonna be a lot of upkeep, right? Um, and I looked at my own gravel road, and I, I have it, uh, an estimate done of how much it costs to have asphalt, a, a gravel road asphalted. And it's about $10 a square foot on average. If I'm, if I'm correct on that, uh, if I'm not correct, you can correct me. Um, so a so if you extrapolate that and you say just one mile, a ten dollars a square foot, one mile of road that is currently gravel then becomes two to three million dollars uh, potentially. Little, well, that's a little different from our estimate. We uh, we were just looking yesterday at the at the uh, road department's estimate for what it costs to to either um, do triple surface on a gravel road or, or uh, uh, asphalt. Is that the, 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 as, the tar and uh, Tar and chip would be the tri yeah. triple surface. Um, I'm trying to think, I believe it was $168,000 a mile, does that sound right, right, for asphalt? Yes. Yeah. So I mean, we exactly calculated like about a mile eight? rather than about a square foot. But, how wide is that road? So I, my estimates, yeah. and I apologize, are, are for a non-divided two-lane uh, road in the rural locale specifically. Um, how wide are we talking about the cost there? I think typically, was it 40 feet or 30 feet? Mm -hmm. Th wait, 30? Yes. Okay, so for 30 feet wide, one mile, should cost about 168000 to pass all it. We just uh, we just did. Uh, sorry, we have the final figures on on uh, board town. Uh, I I have not seen the final figures on what uh, board town cost is. We just paid eleven miles on board town road. 
and we're anticipating it to be about 1.2 million. Okay, so my numbers are obviously, uh, I, I did just plug that into an estimator, and I, I'm well, sure, if, certain that you all would correct me if I was wrong. If, if you're looking at a small area, you know, maybe it would be about a square foot, and that makes a difference, but um, when you're looking at a, a several miles of road, uh, I don't know, maybe more efficiency, but that's what we're looking to pay uh, for board tech. Well, where I'm kind of going with it is like, I've got a friend who lives off of Gunstock Road in the subdivision there. They've got the tar and chip uh, asphalt there and along with some of the roads are, I guess the developer just never bothered finishing um, the asphalting and tar and chipping and some of the roads are just gravel, some of them, you know, it's, it's a heck of a mess out there. And when you have these developments that go belly up, the developers who don't complete the job, and they don't complete the roads either, right? Um, so then it becomes an issue of the people who live in those subdivisions don't know whether to raise their HOA fees or to contact the county or what they're going to do about it. It certainly is creating a confusion for people. Could you imagine if, if Kusawati was gravel? Um, <laughs> what would be happening there? So we're looking at subdivisions almost equally as big as that to the south of us, and who knows what's laying ahead of us and what's expanding out there. And Yukon is kind of giving them me this kind of nervous feeling that um, you know I'm going to get a lot more phone calls from people who are not happy about the condition of the roads and there's no relief coming in any time in the near future in the future because you all are not the responsible party for maintaining those roads right. and um, these developers are getting a heck of a deal putting in gravel roads versus us you all requiring them or creating some kind of ordinance requiring them I, I'm assuming it doesn't exist I don't haven't looked and done legwork. But um, why are we not requiring these developers to put some put to asphalt? I mean, we've got enough land out there. You can say this the impervious surface issue is not is not an issue really. So why are we allowing them to get all cheap? I guess is uh, the question because I've seen what the result is on the other end. And I sat with a friend who lives off Gunstock in a, in a in a subdivision that. Well, they've got really nice homes and you, nobody wants to visit because the, um, the, the roads are so so plotted and rutted. And I just think that this is an effort that could be, um, this is an angle that I guess we could take to slow or kind of discourage some of these developers if they thought it a, a tremendous cost. Of course, with that comes curbing, potentially it comes drainage, it comes a lot of other things, right? Um, they got to come to the table with a lot more to, because really the end, at the end of the day, well, the only thing we're really concerned about is the residents here long term. Mm -hmm. And they're, um, so if we want the residents in the long term to be able to get to their driveways, be happy, not calling about complaining about road conditions, so on and so forth, um, then it would, and we want to, and we want to slow growth, or overdevelopment, I should say, um, to an organic pace, not what we're experiencing today, I would certainly say that um, that would be an avenue. It's something we can look at in terms of, it would take an ordinance change, uh, and it's something that we can look at. I will say this, when it comes to buying a home in a subdivision, um, boy, I can't believe I'm saying this, but the best friend you can have is an HOA. Um, and a lot of people don't like an HOA because, uh, you know, one of the downsides is, uh, uh, you, some things you can't do without asking permission. People don't like that. But it's kind of like zoning. It's for a reason to protect everybody's property values. But the big thing about an HOA is that typically they're responsible for maintaining the roads in the neighborhood. Um, where I live, we have an HOA and we pay uh, quarterly assessments. And within the scope of those assessments is road maintenance. We have to pave our own roads, we have to maintain our own roads. But if we've got a problem with roads, we've got somewhere to go, which is the HOA, and they are supposed to have a fund, a road fund, that can take care of these things. Uh, and, I, and I found that to be the case where you have an HOA. The real problem that I encounter personally when I get the phone calls from people who have the, have, they're on a private road and they want to have that road brought into the county maintained system, is they're in an area where there is no HOA. And if there is no HOA, 
it's up to the people who own the property up and down that road to keep it maintained. Um, there's a lot of roads we have like that where the people who live up and down that road just can't do it. Yeah, you've seen what it costs. You've looked into it. And we don't have a ready solution for them. There's a lot of areas in two where the people up and down that road could easily do it, but they'd rather the county do it. Um, either way, I have to tell them no. Uh, and it doesn't sit very well. So, about the only thing I can say is that if a subdivision's coming in, if you're going to buy in a subdivision, make sure there's an HOA. Yeah, well, um, and, and this is an issue that I, that I had no idea. I, have a, I, you know, I came here from Milton, you know. Yeah, <laughs> um, very different from Milton. Very different world, right? So I had no idea about maintenance of people of uh, rattle roads, what it would mean, but, um, what a pain in the mud it could be when you got a sleeping grandchild in the back seat and you're trying to make it out of your road and it's, there's a lot of bumps, right? Yeah. I got no idea. That's just practical living now. I, I accept that that's the way that it is. It's just, you know, world living. But uh, a lot of these folks are going to be buying into these big subdivisions with no idea um, what lies ahead. And, and um, um, I just think that it's 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 not just it's not just about looking to that with maintenance and inconvenience and residents because we want everybody to be happy, right? But it really is uh, also a measure that can be taken to put have them put a little more skin in the game, make it a little less lucrative for them. Um, a little less money to take off the table. I'm not trying to be punitive. I just think that it, you know, it's a way to deal with, deal with some headache in the future, coming from residents who are not happy about their maintenance on the road, and then I'll, um, um, you know, slow them down. When, and I'm going to change this subject on here just a little bit. Uh, back to the uh, vineyards. Um, I was, uh, I told the lady on Facebook, I'll check into this and get back to her. I checked into it when I tried to get back to her, I couldn't find my post <laughs> amongst everything else to respond. But uh, that's another one of those situations where they bought property that was zoned R1. And that means that they only need an acre and a half for a house. They're actually doing three acre lots, so they're way beyond what they would have to do. They are, they're putting in home sites based on the current zoning. And the point of the <coughs> is that never came through us. Didn't have to come through us. Uh, they bought land that was zoned for R1. They're putting in homes um, less dense than what R1 actually requires and they don't need our approval. And that, I think, is something, uh, it's a message that I kind of like to get out because I would venture to say, the, I'm not gonna say the majority of, of units that are being put in, but the majority of new subdivisions, uh, including the smaller ones and all that go in, uh, are ones that don't necessarily come through us. If you're not looking for a, uh, for a zoning change for high density, you just do it. You know, you don't have to, to come here for it approval on it. And uh, that's one of the best example of that. Well, then, then and that has nothing to do with what you're saying about yeah. the roads and all, but it's just something I want Charlie. to mention. Yeah. Could I uh, kick in the changes that were done to the ordinance in June of this year? Come on up. Just as a in June of this year, the ordinance changes that went into place, any lot size, three acres or more, is required to use hardship for the roads. Now, the only option for gravel is a class E road, and those are when you only have 10 or fewer lots accessible by that road, and it is rare that you have class E road in the, in the subdivision that we're seeing now. But uh, we do have anything under three acres is required asphalt roads. Three acres and more tar chip is required. So can um, we look to see tar and chip at it uh, vineyards? I think that's going to be an option for them simply because their their beginnings was before the ordinance changes. Anything that started being developed before those changes so were in place for grandfather, I, I do believe that the option is going to be possibly tar and chip, but 
they don't have to just simply because they did three acres and up and at that time you could do a gravel road. Class D road was a gravel road <coughs> if you had three acres or more per <coughs> Well, tarnship's always going to be an option for anybody. I mean, but it's now a requirement unless you have class D roads, you're required to use tarnship. Yeah, or unless you're grandfathered. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, anything going forward from June of this year going forward, uh, as a matter of fact, I've talked with a couple of three this week and last week that were wanting to develop and they wanted three acre tracks, and I, I told them, well, you have to put in township yeah. roads. So that doesn't uh, help you in terms of the vineyards, but. Uh, at the vineyards? Yeah, the, yeah. the pictures I saw. Can you come to the vineyard? So they're okay. so that the developers then are clear that that must be tar and chip. Because at this at this point, um, and and I'm just relying. I have not been out there, and I'm relying on aerial drone. And I am too. I haven't actually gone out there. For um, this. And, and so and that's what I'm. And those are gravel roads. I mean, those are not tar and chip roads that are in the video. Now I don't. I don't know if they've been changed since the videos. I don't know the date of it. It could have been right. You know, three but, months ago. Could have been last week. But to your point. Um, they, because they preceded the latest change, uh, it would be an option for them, it's not a requirement. But uh, further to your point, going forward, anybody who wants to do that would have to, would have to pay you in that situation. Because one of the things I said early on when we first getting involved in all of this is I was absolutely floored by the amount of leeway developers have up here. I mean, they don't look for anything else but like skin again, right? They just come up here, they see a lot of land, there's not a lot of ordinance that limits well, them. They buy up huge tracts of land and then they don't even have to come and talk to the county government to come and put in things. They can put in gravel road, they can put tar and chip, whatever their budget or you know, will or whim is. And um, they're we're operating, they're running our county. I, I think that- Not the other way around. Yeah, I, I think that there's a distinction to be made. Um, First of all, in, in the rural counties, you're, you're going to find that it's not as strict as it is in the, in the dense counties. Um, I have said on a number of occasions, I don't have a problem with the local uh, builders. You know, they're not the ones who are buying a thousand acres and doing all this stuff. Uh, to your point, the people that are buying huge tracts of land divided up into hundreds and thousands of home sites. Those are the outside developers that are coming in, they're buying the land, they're doing whatever, and then they're taking their money and running. And those are the people that I do have issues with, but. Um, yeah, those developers I am using our local realtors to set up a property they've got their own realtors even, they're so big. Right. They have their own timber cutting company division. They've got their own um, grading division. They, they cut out local industry and they bring their own people in from out of town. Um, not, not for everything, but for most of it. So so not only are we living with it, we're cut out of it. We've got issues we have to look at. Yeah, okay, thank and you. Obviously, we'll try to do that. Thank you. Chair, ladies and gentlemen of the commission, staff, uh, constituency, my name is Tom Watley, 67, let's try it again, 76, Brumby Trail. Um, on your note on the HOA, sir, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, a lot of them now, I, I live in a community that was first established in 1997. There are a few homes that are duplicate, but for all intents and purposes, no two homes are the same, no two lots are exactly the same, um, but they did, within the past two years decided they want to be an HOA because we're built out of about 46 homes. And so they did become an HOA and one of the things that you brought out is that now they're going to require impact fees on the remaining lots. I wish they would have done this in the start because now we've had to start from scratch to build a road yeah. fund. Yeah. And to pave a road <laughs> in a community like that with all cul-de-sacs is uh, very expensive. You're talking a lot of money for a small community. 
So, um, you know, sounds like impact fees might be a good idea for all the, you know, the builders coming in with concrete trucks and big flatbeds that are bringing in the, the trusses and stuff like that because they are tearing up the roads even out on Yukon just yeah. traveling out there. But it's, it, it, that, yeah. that's for another sideshow, I think. Um, and maybe Karen will correct me, Mr. Chair, I, I, you said 60 units, but that's 60 units per item on the, that you just voted on, right, on 9 and 10, that's well, about 20. Oh, uh, 60 units uh, would be what they could get based on the lot size. Okay. They would still be limited to 50 based on our moratorium over 50, unless they just wanted to wait till it expired. But based on what Karen's saying, it looks like now there are other restrictions that are going to limit them to 12 to 14. Yes, sir. Um, well, the, the item that y'all just ruled on with regard to the Yukon, uh, 85, the items 9 and 10. Yes. That was actually a total of 120 units, I believe, right? That's with an R4. So an that R4. was if they got their If they got their way. way. Right. On that note, let me segue into your moratorium, sir. And I had this discussion with Chairman Mooney, and, and he was technically correct when I first brought this up. You know, what about our moratorium? And he said, that's for subdivisions. Now, I, I think y'all's action that you took with regard to the moratorium was in the spirit of the moratorium was development of, say, 120, or, or development of 50 units and, and less during the time period of the moratorium. But I think that in the public's mind, and in my mind, sir, if, if it's a townhome division, uh, uh, division with 120 units, a named townhome division, it, it didn't have a name yet, I believe, at the planning and zoning meeting, but you know, obviously they're going to name it something, yeah. you know, when it, when it was originally proposed. I think in the spirit of y'all's actions, that, that should because we were on a technical word of what is a subdivision. But I think then a builder could come in and say, well, oh, wait, if we're not going to be a subdivision, we'll just build 120 townhomes. Yeah. It was a planned unit development, wasn't it? It was a planned unit yeah. development. You have to have the zoning and, you know. Right. But yeah. yes, they could. They, they could under the, under the current wording. Because. But, yeah, they still have to have the zoning. Because Chairman Moody reminded me, no, Tom, that, that follows under subdivisions but well you're, you're right in that i think the spirit of the the thing was that we just don't have any more over 50. whatever you want to call it yes sir um these folks though were already in progress at the time so okay. it didn't apply to them uh or would not have applied to them uh once this was made anything that was already in the works uh you know could continue on so Actually, uh, if we're down to 12 to 14 total units in that particular area, I think we'd probably come out just about as good as we could ever hope to for that area. I would agree. So that's why I appreciate um, you all doing it. Yes, that's an end around on him. He's still going to get his money and run. But, um, you know, it's, we're not going to sit there 150 cars back up at that four-way stop yeah. in the city of East LJ. So. And it's the impact on the four-way stop that was the real issue for me. Yeah, yeah, me as well, because I travel that every day like you do, sir, coming down Yukon, and it's, uh, it, 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 if school's out getting out or, or if we're at holiday, forget it. It's, yeah. it's a nightmare. Um, that's it, and y'all uh, have a terrific Christmas. Thank you, you too. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yes, yes ma'am.
two thirty we pulled in there. They still were not able to accept any more garbage. They did have the um, the uh, high top containers though, did they not? They had nothing. Nothing. The gates were shut and they wouldn't let anybody in. What time was this, Sadie? There's there was no way to dump the garbage. You could get yeah. in. I, I mentioned something about it and I got a lot of negative feedback on that, but why don't you drive here or why don't you drive there? But we're right out there on the Murray County line. And, and which one was it? What time? Out on 282 at the, at the firehouse there. Okay. And it was Saturday? Saturday. Monday. The end of Monday, Saturday. I'm sorry. We were there Monday, but as of Saturday afternoon, it, it was packed full and stayed full until 2.30 two, until two in okay. the afternoon on Monday. The, and it was later than that that they came and got it, because that's what time we yeah. came by there. About the only thing I can say to that is I just want you to be aware. Yes, ma'am. That, 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 that has happened, and, and all I can say is that the new folks have assured us that they are going to admit that. Yeah, so. I just wanted to be, be aware of it, though, so that Thank like you. I said, that if it pops up again, because, yeah. you know, by the time we make two or three trips back to the, the, yeah. you know, the garbage to keep the bears from eating everything up, we, uh, well, between now and, and when the changeover is complete, there's probably going to be a number of spotty things, maybe similar to this. Yeah. We're going to try to avoid it as much as we can. But um, when you're in the middle of changing over something of that uh, size, yeah. I'm sure we're going to have some issues. But hopefully, once the changeover is done, it's going to take care of a lot of what you're talking maybe about. Maybe the wrinkles will come out of it. <laughs> All right. I hope so. All right, thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. John D. Lorenzo. Um, I just want to express concern about all the new subdivisions off of 282 on the, on the river and the creeks. Um, Mountaintown Creek, it's it's really sad. And Tails Creek, that's a really unique little feature there. I don't think there's anything like it in the area. I mean, it's it's been cut to bedrock for thousands and thousands of years. It's amazing. And there are native trout in it. There are brook trout in that creek. And uh, that subdivision is go is cutting. These people are buying land right on that. I mean, they're they're taking the creek. Not only the the, uh, the habitat there, but also the water quality. I mean, these people are coming in and building big houses. They're going to have nice lawns. They're going to spray insecticide and herbicide and all this other stuff, and it goes right into the water system. And you know, maybe it won't kill us. We're too old. You know, we can we can drink all that poison we want, and it might die a little bit younger, but. Our children and our grandchildren have to drink that water too. And uh, all these subdivisions are built on watersheds and I don't believe they belong there. And somebody's got to take that into consideration. I mean, we, we've got to protect what God has given us. And if we're just flushing it down the toilet right now. People got to be concerned. It's, just, it's really serious matter. Once you, once you lose the water, you can't get it back. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there's nobody else, we'll go to the next items. Discussion of possible action of budget amendments. Um, I think we may have taken care of everything. You know, can y'all think of any other amendments we need at this point? Are you saying anything? No, I don't know. I'm not aware of anything. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, one thing we might want to talk about tomorrow night is uh, the Progress Road building. Uh, did y'all get a chance? Uh, well, the separate thing. Um, I had uh, originally thought that the Progress Road building had uh, serious structural issues. Turns out it does not. Most of it's cosmetic and it can actually be refurbished. 
So what I may do is, and I try to think about it uh, between now and tomorrow night, is uh, the money that we have allocated to move the new building is enough to move it and refurbish it. Uh, we still need to move it, but I would like to be able to make that money a kind of a dual purpose also. I'm not asking for more money, just uh, but that it also could be used to refurbish the progress road building. So, uh, I'll, I'll bring that up tomorrow night. Um, while we're, before we get too far out of the citizens wishing to speak. You'll add that to the agenda tomorrow night. Right? Well, the, uh, tomorrow night. yeah, the budget amendments is not over. No, the, okay, you, you're going to treat I'm going to talk to you about it during the budget amendment. Okay. Sorry. Um, and I guess this really is kind of under the citizens wishing to speak. Uh, something I just want y'all to think about between now and tomorrow night. Did you get a chance to go look at the uh, old jail building? I did. Okay. I have not Okay, well, when you go look at it, uh, we have that building currently insured for $1.3 million. Uh, we had our, our uh, we had our insurance folks come out and give us uh, appraisals on all the buildings we have insured. And their appraisal in that building was way over a million dollars. Uh, I wouldn't mind if the building burned down tomorrow if it didn't spread and nobody got hurt. Um, I just don't think we need to pay for, to insure that building for over a million dollars. But y'all look at it and think about it. There's not much that can burn it. It's on a brief block. And with everything that's in it, with the exception of the one small area that's our sign shop, everything in it's just junk. I'd say remove it. Um, and that, that's not something that we really need a, uh, a uh, resolution on, it, but uh, I don't want to do it uh, without y'all being aware of it. <laughs> okay. Um, next item is appointment of a member to the Department of Family and Children Services. Um, Beth MacArthur uh, is coming off of that board. And uh, <coughs> Tiffany Watson has agreed to serve. Uh, unless y'all have uh, any other candidate, I think Tiffany would be an excellent choice. Uh, there also was mention in the letter uh, uh, saying that Tiffany was willing to serve about uh, selecting Catherine Mayer as chairman. Uh, I don't believe we select the chairman for that board, so I'm gonna kind of ignore that part of it. They're gonna have to select their own chairman. Um, so we got okay with him. Okay. Appointment of two members to the Board of Public Health, uh, Curtis Kingsley and Tracy Wells, uh, each of their terms are ending, uh, and they're both willing to serve again. Uh, so my recommendation would be that we reappoint them. Mm -hmm. Appointment of two members to the Gilmer Pickens Joint, uh, Joint Authority. Uh, Don Callahan and Lex Rainier on that, their terms are expiring. They're both willing to serve again. So I would <coughs> suggest that we, we uh, reappoint them. Right. Appointment of a member to the Planning Commission Board. That we actually don't need to do anymore. Um, well, we, we kind of do. We kind of do. Uh, Dorothy Logan's uh, term is expiring and she had initially decided she was going to step off of it, but then said that she would be willing to continue to serve, so I think we should, uh, I would recommend we reappoint her. Sure. Let me make a comment on those, these appointments, yeah. if I could. Uh, rather than asking before we know anything about it, if someone is willing to serve again, how about asking uh, us have a chance to say, do you know anyone you'd like to appoint here? Oh, sure. Um, I think we're kind of after we're, we're putting the cart before the horse, is what you're, you're saying, right? Pardon? We kind of put the cart before the horse. That's a good way to put it. Uh, yeah, I'm fine with that. Um, the only uh, down, potential downside to it would be when we get into the meeting. Uh, if nobody knows of anybody else and this person's not willing to serve, it can delay us for a month, but I don't see that as a big issue. Yeah, it'll take a little more time if we're notified that. Yeah. 
and before the people are asked if they want to not serve. You can let us know what for me. Just who you are. Let us let us know at least one meeting ahead. Right. That would be great. Yeah, that would work. Okay. Discussion possible action of a new emergency medical service billing company. Um, the uh, MS folks have been struggling with the company that they've had, uh, and that they're uh, they've kind of gotten behind on, on a good many things, and there's a lot of things to correct and catch up. Chief, you want to address that? <coughs> previously at a 5% recovery for what they built, they would go ahead and honor that 5% uh, with the new contract. It would normally be between 6 and 7%. So based upon that, uh, we'd like to move forward with MedCorp. They're out of Jasper. They have a lot of the billing around this general area. Uh, they have a really good recovery rate. And since we started, they've taken over We've actually, we get daily reports of what's been billed for the, the previous day and what's on hold, which indicates there, that maybe it's missing a signature or maybe some mileage, uh, maybe off. So that gets corrected in-house and then it goes back to them. So we're very happy so far in the short period that we've had them in a couple of weeks. And uh, we look forward to having a, a good recovery rate with them and moving Okay. my recommendation to approve this. And, and it's more really sticking with the successor company um, since they bought out the old. Yes. Company. So the company you've been having trouble with has been assumed by a new company that yes. you want to business with. Yeah, the new company is MedCorp. They purchased the prior company that we were in contract with. But they have improved things considerably since they made the purchase. And they, they've actually suggested some increases of rates, which we'll have to, you know, we'll bring that to you for uh, probably January, uh, just to be consistent with some of the general, the areas and surrounding counties that they deal with, just with some small modifications and some pay rates, mileage rates, um, that are acceptable through Medicare, Medicaid as well. And also, um, uh, where we go on and we treat on scene, but we don't transport, it's called a treatment, no transport. So we actually, an ambulance will go to a home, uh, they'll provide some form of service, uh, maybe a diabetic patient that needs sugar or glucagon, uh, we'll administer that, and then usually they feel better, they don't wanna go to the hospital, but we did spend uh, money and resources getting there and equipment, and they do have a feature, it's called uh, treatment, no transport, and uh, we can bill for that if the insurance company allows it. So if they do not, we will not bill them. Okay. Any questions? Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody need to take your station? I'd like to take a few minutes, yes. Okay. All right. Um, I make a motion for an executive session with no action taken. Okay. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. All right. We appreciate it, folks. We'll be going into executive session and don't anticipate any action. Afterwards.